It's probably that day where snooker for me changed. I kind of thought, well, I'm pretty good at this game. They thought it was going to be too difficult. I was going to get beat all the time. I was going to fall out of love with snooker. The talent kind of came to me straight away. It was the fact that I'd beaten Steve. That was the big thing in that event. I'm going to win the World Championship by the time I'm 21. One thing in Ronnie, unless he's Benjamin Button, he's not going to beat that one. I just used to go to Chris and know I was going to win, feeling invincible. I think I came second in the sports personality to Gascoigne. Although amazing to equal the record, I thought, I have to win seven. What's the point of just being the same? This is probably the last time I played proper snooker at the crucible for me the enjoyment is winning and it's one that still hurts me to this day it's the reason I, I called my autobiography me and the table this is basically what i used to do from the age of i don't know 15 16 be in a room, in a club, just potting balls basically but it's one of the reasons being in a club i also think was better than i did have a table at home at the end of my career and it wasn't it wasn't quite the same because I think playing in a club, it's got to feel like you're, you're going to work. You're actually going, you go the same time every day. I used to arrive at the club about half past 10 and leave at the same time about four or five o'clock. So it's basically like a job. And I think it's got to seem like a job. And then you get that, it's talking about outside noises, you get that atmosphere of being in a club. And it actually, it, it, makes, it makes practice that a little bit more enjoyable. I see a lot of players now, they have um, practice tables in sort of uh, units in business parks where there's literally no noise. So there's no atmosphere. Um, I kind of used to like the sort of club atmosphere of the would, people would come around and watch, people would, would be sort of milling around rather than just be, you know, I find these, some of these units the guys have a bit Although the conditions on the table, the light and everything's perfect, I find it a bit cold in terms of atmosphere. I wouldn't like to be stuck in there for four, five, six hours every day. But this would basically be me for, well, it's basically my manager. Uh, Ian Doyle was the one that, um, when I first turned pro, I was kind of like mucking about a bit in the club where I was, playing mates. Um, not really working on my game, just basically having a good time, treating it as almost like a hobby. Um, he sort of uh, had a spying mission to see what I was doing. And one of the conditions for him taking over my career was that I had to go to his club and it had to become a job of work. Um, he had an office um, outside the room where, the, where my table was and basically said you're going to stay in here from 10 o'clock till 6 o'clock, seven days a week. I hated it in the beginning because it was just like I'd never, it was probably that day where snooker for me changed. It changed from a hobby to being a job and a career. It was something that rather than going to club when I wanted to have fun, it was, I had to be in a club. I had to be at the table to work. And basically this is what I would do for six, seven, eight hours a day, seven days a week. It was a long way from um, getting a small table for my Christmas, six foot by three foot table when I was 12 years old. Because that's how it started. I'd never played snooker before. I never even watched snooker on TV, but fell in love with the game straight away. My father's father was, a, was supposedly a really good snooker player. He, he died before I was born. My dad wasn't really that good. He could put a couple of balls, but that was it. So the talent kind of came to me straight away. I was able to, I just knew what to do. And within sort of three, four weeks, I was making 50 breaks. Fortunately, mum and dad didn't force me to get my homework done. I think they always thought it was going to be a success at snooker. I think my dad, especially, he always thought it was going to be world champion. I think uh, probably confirmed I went to Pontins in Prestatin when I was 14. 
and uh, it was just really to see how how good I was compared to the the other other kids my age really under 16s um, and I won it first tournament I entered got a hundred pounds cash and a hundred pounds Pontins vouchers which I never used but um, that kind of I kind of thought, well, I'm pretty good at this game. You know, against the other sort of boys and girls my age up and down the country, I, I, I won it. And that was sort of, um, just made me want to play even more. The only job I've ever had, my dad used to have fruit and vegetable shops. I used to pack potatoes into three pound, five pound, 10 pound bags. And that was to pay for my practice because the club where I played. Actually, the, the first club I played in was called Malocos in Dunfermline. It was a real old school snooker club. There was no bar, no restaurant, just an old club where you could get like, go into the office and get a can of Coke or something. That was the first time I played at a full size table. But as I say, when I had that, that job to pay for my practice, it was uh, called the Classic Snooker Centre, still in Dunfermline. And uh, yeah, so that's where I used to spend all weekends. Because obviously I still had school, but by then I wasn't, I mean, at the end of my school and I left at 15 and a half, I think I, I had four O-levels. I turned up for two and failed the other two. It's pretty clear that it was only one thing that I was going to do. I won the Scottish Amateur Senior title when I was 14. Went and played in the World Amateur in Dublin. Didn't do too well. At 15, I retained that Scottish Amateur Senior title. And in those days, in order to turn professional, you had to either win the World Amateur or your national title. So I had a decision from winning the Scottish Amateur to either turn could turn pro at 16, because that was the minimum age then, or play in the World Amateur again, which my dad and everyone thought I had a good chance of winning. I played that up in a terrible positional shot there. Just concentrating this minute. Oh, terrible. I think that was thinking about the story. But yeah, so I decided to turn pro. Decided there was nothing more I could learn in the amateur circuit. That was all going so well. So I think between my father and I, we decided that, as I say, I couldn't learn anything else as an amateur, so why not just turn pro at 16, which a, a lot of people frowned on, um, especially the sort of older brigade of snooker. They thought it was going to be too difficult. I was going to get beat all the time. I was going to fall out of love with snooker. And it was difficult in the beginning. I was losing a lot more than I was winning. But I loved it. I loved the, the fact that you had perfect tables. Um, you had to wear the bow tie, the whole stuff. You had referees. Um, the whole situation just, I loved it straight away. But obviously being pro, there's, there's a lot of expense involved. And so that's why Ian Doyle, who, who sponsored the Scottish Amateur um, competition, he came into my life. Not immediately, but then, as I say, he imposed this regime, which, as I say, I hated, but within a couple of weeks of practicing six hours a day, and it's why I always say now, practice is so important, working hard at the game. Okay, what I was doing is probably too much, but my game, I could, I could feel my game improving almost day by day. To the point where I won the Scottish Professional Championship, um, which is sort of first major win as a pro. Then I did this tour with Steve Davis in Scotland, six nights tour. Obviously Steve Davis was the number one, the best player in the world. Um, Jimmy White was my hero when I first started. When I first got the table for Christmas, it was all about Jimmy, just because of the shots he played. Took my eye off the pot there. 
Look, perfect position. That's a classic example of never take your eye off the pot. But Jimmy was my hero. But then when I seen Steve Davis winning, I wanted to be like him. So we did the six night tour and uh, he beat me every night, humiliated me, but I learned so much. So basically that routine there, when I was in the room for six hours, I would try and do that routine. I'd set up a different one now, but I try and do the lineup 10 times in a row. And if I missed, I would start again. I'd go back to one. Basically a, a snooker player's life is routine after routine, repetition, 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 pot and balls all day. It's one of the reasons why I think people always ask why do snooker players never play on to like 70, 80. And I know that the longevity of O'Sullivan and Higgins and Williams, these people, they're almost 50 is incredible. But one of the reasons you don't, certainly for myself, is just being able to practice, do this still day in, day out. Very difficult. I think the top players don't practice as much as perhaps they used to. So the, the tour with Steve Davis, it, it taught me I mean, it taught me a couple of things. It told me that my game wasn't anywhere near where, it, you know, miles away from where it should be. If I want to be, do anything in a game, not just be world champion, be world number one on the bed, just to basically to win matches. And but it wasn't even that, it was just the way he treated the whole, he could have treated it as like an exhibition tour and not tried, but every day of the, on the day of the exhibition, he would find a club to practice. And then every night, he would just take me apart. Basically, because I was just going for everything. I had no safety game whatsoever. Some would say still don't, but definitely then I didn't. But I actually jumped, jumped the story a bit. It was after that tour that I won the Scottish professional title because one of the reasons I won it, I think, is because I thought, well, these guys aren't Steve Davis. You know, I'm going to get chances against these guys. They're not going to just clear the table every time I miss. So it, was, it sort of took the pressure off a bit. My first professional title, um, as opposed to not just exclusively Scottish players, was in Australia in 1987, I think it was, in Sydney. I remember I had to share a room with Mike Hallett, which wasn't great. Nothing against Mike, but I just don't like sharing. But uh, I actually beat Mike in the final. Sharing a room, that's quite awkward. Beat Alex Higgins, I think in the semi-final. But actually the thing about Alex is when, when, when I turned pro at 16, he used to always ask me to practice with him. Whenever we were at venues, he used to always say, come and have a game, come and have a game. And I couldn't believe it. I was playing like, getting to practice with Alex Higgins. You know, one of my heroes. Because when I, when I had a small table at home, basically I used to just watch snooker on TV and see a shot and then just try and recreate it on a small table. Obviously you couldn't because a lot of the shots, because of the cloth and the balls is nowhere near. That's how I learned, really, just by watching TV. But to practice with Alex Higgins was just, uh, was, was amazing. But the tournament in Australia, Steve Davis wasn't in it. So I still, had, still hadn't beaten Steve as a pro. I'd been a pro for like a couple of years. Every time I still hadn't beaten him, even in an exhibition. So. My manager came up with this idea of watching all the videos of my matches with Steve. What I seen from it, then, you know, apart from, I'm just gonna cheat a bit, apart from the fact that he was, you know, beating me and my safety game wasn't great, but the thing I, I seen from it was that I was actually was getting chances. In my head, I was basically getting no chances, but he did miss. But because I was so, kind of in awe of him, thinking he was invincible. I didn't see the fact I was getting 
chances to pop balls, but I just wasn't, wasn't taking them. If I was able just to take my chances, I could beat them. So that season, my first major ranking event was the Rothmans Grand Prix at the Hexagon in Reading. And I uh, played Steve in the quarterfinals. And that was the first time. That was my first time beating Steve Davis. Went on to win it, beat Dennis in the final. More than the, probably even winning the, the tournament, which is obviously to win a, a major ranking, I, mean, I was 18, it was the fact that I'd beaten Steve. That was the big thing in that event. I now knew that I could go on and, and, and be, or challenge Steve. I think I won another title that season. I think I won the British Open. So steadily moving up the rankings. Obviously the, the ambition for every player when they, when they pro, when they first start, if they've got serious ambitions, obviously be world champion. I actually said in an interview with the Daily Record in Scotland, when I turned pro at 16, that I'm going to win the world championship by the time I'm 21. Now it was a bit of bravado. Not sure whether I totally believed it, but that was kind of the line that they were, we were going to tell everyone through Ian Doyle, through my dad. I'm 21 in the world championship. And well, first of all, I beat John Parrott in the semi-final to become world number one. So in doing that, I was just so confident um, going into the final. And obviously in the final, I meet Jimmy White, who's my hero. Um, and the reason, I think the, the reason we, Jimmy and I love playing each other, our games were very compatible. We both played very open game. So we knew we were gonna give the other one chances. If I was playing Steve, I knew I had to really be patient and wait. I knew that I would get chances. I was so confident going at that final. And uh, yeah, to be, achieve my ambitions, world number one, world champion at 21 which is still a record, by the way. It's one thing in Ronnie, unless he's Benjamin Button, he's not gonna beat that one. And then of course, you're, you're, you're the best player in the world, which I loved. You're the one that everyone wants to beat. You're the target. Again, I love that. Next season, I think I won six. Five or six tournaments, I think. I won the first four ranking events of the season. Um, yeah, dominated the season. Got to the World Championship, of course, the crucible curse that everyone talks about where no one has ever defended the World Championship after winning it a first time at the crucible. And I was convinced I was gonna do it. People thought that maybe, because I'd won so many tournaments and you might be a bit tired, there might be a bit of fatigue. I thought it was all nonsense. I lost in the quarterfinal to Steve James. Absolutely devastated. I think the match finished about 10 at night and uh, said to John, who used to drive me around, it's okay, I want to go home back to Scotland. I don't want to stay overnight, got to get home. I didn't say one word to him for four hours, the whole journey, absolutely. Devastated, sulked in my apartment for a week, I think. Didn't turn on the TV, didn't want to watch the World Championship. Even having so much success in that season. I think I came second in the sports personality at the end of that year to Gascoigne. Paul Gascoigne, who uh, obviously England got to the semi-finals of the World Cup. I came second. The 90s was obviously my, my time. From 92, obviously winning five world titles in a row, uh, feeling invincible. I mean, I just used to go to the Crystal and know I was gonna win. The famous story that I've told in my book, asking uh, my wife at the time to bring me my jacket, because I wanna wear that after the final at the party, even before the tournaments even started. Just taking for granted winning. It's a great feeling to have. So five years in a row, four finals against Jimmy. Suppose, could have, probably should have won or lost two of those. 
Jimmy Bean, 14 8 in front. And obviously, the one where the side in frame. Jimmy missing the black of his spot. One of them I won, can't remember which year. Uh, maybe you guys can leave a comment, remind me, I can't remember. One year, I won with a fractured elbow, went to the bathroom in the middle of the night and slipped, used my hand to break the fall and fractured elbow. So I was pretty much in a bit of pain the whole bit. I still managed to win. Because basically what happened was I couldn't, I wouldn't be able to lift the rest. I had to get the referee to lift the rest. That was too sore. And sort of getting down and getting up, I was in agony. But once I could put the weight down on the table, I was actually fine to play the shot. There was no pain then. Those were good times in the 90s. And of course, winning the seventh against my old friend Mark Williams to break the record. Because basically when I won six, I equaled Steve Davis's record. And the next morning, although amazing to equal the record, I thought, I have to win seven. What's the point of just being the same? You know, similar question to what I asked Ronnie. Surely he wants to win the eighth. And who knows, he might do. I'll explain what I do here. So I used to have all the reds, so the B, five, 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 five. And basically you're putting blues into the corners and just going round to the, to the other side. It's quite a good routine for queuing, straight queuing. I mean, queuing's probably not as straight as it used to be. But it was something that I used to rely on a lot. It's a great shot to get you back in if you lost position. Basically, you're just going around the table, putting blues into the corners. And you have to go, ah, oh, fluke. But yeah, I won, I won the seventh world title. And said in the press conference that actually, if, if I didn't win another match in my whole career, I couldn't, you know, I couldn't want for anything else. So kind of switched off in that, in that one comment, actually. Obviously didn't win another world title. So this is a weakness, so you have to keep going until you pot it, obviously. Two finals I lost after that. First one to Ken Doherty. Sorry, not after that, I'm getting it wrong. Ken was 97, that was during the 90s, so yeah, I lost to Ken. I actually outscored him points-wise and in centuries, but lost, lost the match. I'm just gonna adjust my aiming a little bit. I've missed two of them to this knuckle, so I'm just gonna adjust a little bit. Hopefully this will make a difference. Excuse me while I concentrate. Yeah, just needed to concentrate. Yeah, so two finals, one to Ken in 97, and one to Ebden in 2002, where I beat Ronnie in the semi-final. Probably the only grudge match I've ever had in my career. Um, on the morning of the semi-final, before it started, John came to my room with a newspaper and said, have you seen what Ronnie said? I said, no, what is it? Um, so basically a whole lot of stuff saying he was gonna send me back to Scotland, my sad little life, he's gonna beat me, he didn't like me. Um, basically creating this whole bad atmosphere for the match. So I thought, oh, fair enough. If I didn't need to, had the incentive for being in the semi-final of the world, I had even more. This is probably the last time I played proper snooker at the Crucible, it was that semi-final in 2002. Because all the years after that, I didn't play anywhere near um, what I can. But I won that match. I thought that was the final. Um, Peter Ebden beat Matthew Stevens in the other semi-final. I thought whoever won it at Ronnie and I was going to win it. So after I beat Ronnie, I thought, there's no way Peter Ebden can beat me over four sessions. There's just no way. And I went in not fully focused and, and lost 18-17. And it's one that still hurts me to this day. That's the best one of the four. That was good, that one. But basically you've got to keep this routine, you've got to keep going round. So 21 balls, basically keep going round and round. Then when you finish that, then you set up a bit of an angle and do the whole thing again with all 21 balls. And you've got to do it in a row. If you miss, you've got to start again. That was kind of the end um, of my, obviously the 90s, the end of my domination. Um, obviously, my cue smashed, my original cue that I won all the titles with, coming back from Thailand, um, that, that smashed because we, had, we couldn't any longer take them on board because of 9-11. So we had to put them in the hold. So my one-piece cue became a two-piece cue unintentionally. 
So changing cues was quite a big thing in my career. Ooh, that wasn't good. From then on, yeah, from one, I think I won 70 titles maybe with my original cue and won maybe five or six more with, with whatever cue I used since then. Did get back to world number one, but without really dominating anymore. Um, partly because the standard of players was improving, obviously. People say, was it family? I don't think so. I think I was still as dedicated as ever. Um, maybe until sort of 2006, seven, maybe I did stop practicing as much. Um, and then developed, what I've gone about is developed the yips in my cue action, which I still have now and then. 2012. That was poor. That's probably because I'm thinking about how I retired. That's probably why I missed that by so far. Yeah, last world championship I had to qualify for because I dropped down the rankings uh, outside the top 16. So I qualify, play Stuart Bingham, make a 147 in my last appearance at the Crucible. Everyone said, how can you make a 147 and retire? But okay, I say, I've said it many times, out of the 36 shots, I maybe hit five, five or six properly. Um, it was, my game technically was pretty much shot and it was a real struggle. Beat John Higgins after that, in the round after, but it was a poor match. And then my final match, lost 13-2 to Steve Maguire. And uh, yeah, that was it. Retired, had enough. People say that if you enjoy it, you can keep playing. For me, the enjoyment is winning. And once the enjoyment of winning is gone, um, that is, that's, that that's, it takes it away from me, from all, all, the, all the desire to practice goes out the window, really. Still love just hitting balls. I still love coming into a room with a snooker table. I still enjoy doing exhibitions. I still enjoy sometimes hitting the ball nice. Like that, that was quite nice. So as long as there's tables around, I shall keep playing.